Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. and I am the new CEO of Generation Citizen, a national organization that inspires uh, civic participation through action civics classes uh, across the country, giving students the chance to experience real world democracy. And our action civics program is in classrooms from the Bay Area to Oklahoma City, New York City, um, communities small and large around the country. And I'm so glad to be with you uh, today. I'm especially pleased to be moderating a conversation for today's Commonwealth Club program after the Capitol siege, the need for civics education with some um, incredible leaders and, and thought leaders in this space. This program is part of Creating Citizens, the Commonwealth Club's new civic education effort launched just last year. Today, I'm joining you from my home in New York City. I started my job at Generation Citizen on January 4th, 2021 just two days before the riot at the Capitol. We as an organization instantly recognize the need to support teachers and students to have conversations and make meaning of these tragic and scary events. The long overdue to commitment in civics education across the country means there's a short-term outcome of leaving young adults adrift um, in difficult moments like these, but their role as citizens. Um, and uh, it, further leads to a crisis um, in terms of the continued erosion um, of democracy more broadly. Two of our speakers today, Mark and Lauren, um, felt that urgency instantly and um, put together an important um, uh, piece uh, in The Hill. Um, and we look forward to hearing from them about that, that article. <laughs> Before I turn it over to um, our, our great speakers to, to share a little bit about um, their experience and perspective on this moment, I just want to share something. Um, and I know many of you, um, like me, were moved by um, inaugural poet um, Amanda Gorman um, and um, the perspectives um, that she voiced so powerfully in her poem, The Hill We Climb. The first, of course, is that we did not feel prepared to be the heirs of such a terrifying hour. Pandemic, economic crisis, racial injustice, a contentious election, fires um, that continue to demonstrate the climate crisis. And 2021 itself has brought three consecutive and consequential Wednesdays, an insurrection, a second impeachment, and an inauguration. Coming back to Amanda Gorman again, she said on that last Wednesday, we will not be turned around or interrupted by intimidation because we know our inaction and inertia will be the inheritance of the next generation. That's really what we're talking about. We are in this critical moment now for civics education and we're really having, I think, a, a conversation that may be a call for action for comprehensive civic education that is um, different, um, perhaps, than past ones. Um, and we want to talk about how we can have a lasting change in our understanding of diverse civic traditions, how government works, and our roles and responsibilities of citizens. So today, to discuss these issues, I'm really thrilled to be joined by three people who represent different organizations and perspectives on the importance of civics education across the country. We're going to start with hearing from Louise Dubé, who leads iCivics, one of the country's leading civics education organizations, who's pioneering new approaches uh, to this critical issue. And as I mentioned earlier, the author of a recent editorial on civics education published in The Hill, Lauren Leader, the founder of All In Together, a nonprofit, uh, a nonpartisan nonprofit, women's civic education organization, also here in New York City. Um, and um, Mark Updegrove, the president and CEO of the LBJ Foundation in Austin, Texas, and presidential historian for ABC. Um, before we turn it over to them uh, and our conversation, a little bit of housekeeping. If you have a question uh, for me or any of the panelists today, please use the YouTube chat feature. Questions there will be submitted to me throughout the program, and I'll try to ask as many of them as I can, bringing them into our conversation um, or making sure that we get to them um, after we've uh, had a chance to hear from the speakers. Um, and 
I really could not think of a better group to bring together to make this urgent call for action. Um, so I want to begin by uh, hearing from Louise. Why is this such a critical moment? And what makes this moment different from others um, where there has been uh, a discussion of the need for civics education? Well, thank you so much. Thank you to the Commonwealth Club for bringing us together about this important issue. And thank you, Elizabeth, for this uh, beautiful opening. Uh, uh, I think starting with Amanda Gorman is a great place to start. I, I, I think she captured the moment. That's why she's been such a sensation uh, after her poem was read. And, and um, she captured this idea that America is a beautiful ideal and it is also very troubled. And so I'll just talk to my own experience. I'm an immigrant, I came from Canada. Uh, I wanted to come here since I was a little girl. And, and for me, America was this beacon of freedom. It was this pluralism. It was just a, a, a country of exceptional achievement. I understood all of its problems, but I also really believed and, and believed that it was a democracy that every other country looked to as its um, as the best, right? Uh, and uh, I think all of us uh, ordinary Americans that I did, it took January 6th as a personal failure. As really, uh, uh, it was like really, I felt emotionally uh, downtrodden by what had happened to our uh, institution. It shook, um, it shook my pride. Um, and so a lot of people are saying, how the heck did we get here? <laughs> um, but I think as Americans, we have to be more interested in how do we go away from here? How do we rebuild the civic strength of our country? And I think that's going to take all of us, right? Um, and for that, we have to look back a little bit and think about the founders really understand, they understood the fragility of this country and they understood its resilience. I was actually talking to my mother yesterday. She still lives in Canada. She says to me, I was so impressed with these Americans. They dusted themselves off and they put on a great show. It was, <laughs> and I always say, oh, well, yeah, exactly. Americans can do this. So um, I, I, it is not to diminish the incredible uh, divisions that are in this country, but I believe in America and I think we can do this. But the only way to do this, this, this is a country that is very complex. Right. We have a structure that involves multiple layers of government. There is no one entity that's going to tell you the truth, quote unquote. Right. There isn't a way. Self-government is an institution that requires each and every one of us to understand how it works and to be able to talk to others. You, you don't expect other people to agree with you. You expect division. You expect that there will be debates and you just need to engage with them based on truth and fact and evidence. And that you cannot do without education. And, and that it's a requirement of this kind of self-government. Our founder, so iCivics was founded by Sandra Day O'Connor in 2006 um, after she came off the bench and she knew this. She said clearly, uh, civic education and the rules of our self-government are not transferred uh, from generation to generation. They're not transferred to the gene pool. You must teach it anew every generation. So that is what we need to do um, for decades. We have disinvested in civics and history education. We perform at the lowest levels. It is not acceptable. Uh, and uh, K-12 schools are a point of aggregation in which we can make significant change. But the only way to do that, as my co-speaker has pointed out, is to invest in civic education, it, history and civic education. We need to take those things seriously. So in 2018, um, we, based on the legacy and the leadership of Sandra Day O'Connor, who unfortunately could no longer do that work, founded Civics Now. And Civics Now is what you do when you don't have any money. Um, you band together and you do what civics teachers do, which is to organize together uh, a strong force of 
cross ideological organization. So it involves a lot of presidential library foundations, like the one that Mark represents. It involves Generation Citizen that we work with closely, the Center for Civic Ed, the Girl Scouts of America. You're talking about a broad range of organizations that have the same goal prioritize civic education, invest in civic education for our country's civic strength. This is not a political issue. This is an American issue. So we just have to be very uh, clear about that. And then I represent iCivics and at iCivics, we have about 8 million kids every year come and learn on our platform. We're known for our games. They're all free. So parents and teachers can all come. Um, and uh, you can play as though you're the president of the United States in executive command. You can see what that's like. Uh, you can run your own campaign uh, for to, to become president. Uh, you can um, uh, be the uh, county administrators. We have a new game in Texas, actually, uh, to be a county administrator in Texas. So um, all of those things are available there for free. But most of all, there it is a community of educators. We have 120,000 educators. I think we underestimate the desire for educators and young people to learn about civics. It, yes, it is political. Yes, there is fear, but there is also a great deal of enthusiasm on the part of young people and educators to do this work. And, and so I, what I hope will happen is that we allow January 6th to be the wake up moment that it needs to be for our country, just like Sputnik was a wake up moment for us on science in defending our country. January 6th and the insurrection should be a wake up moment that we need to return the investment. And I will make one suggestion as I end, uh, which is that corporations, many of them have paused or they've decided no longer to put in money in political PACs. Um, They've made different kinds of decisions. Why not use some of that money to invest in civic education? Why not make a contribution to this country in that form? So I will leave that with that thought. Thank you, Elizabeth. Yeah, thanks so much, Louise. I, you know, so many great points um, for us to, to pick up on and, and, and thread throughout our conversation today. Um, but, you know, sticking with some of those feelings impressions, ideas that were um, we were swirling with, sitting with um, uh, on and after January 6th. Lauren, I want to go to you. Um, what um, drove you and, and Mark to um, put pen to paper and, and um, share uh, your perspective with the Hill? Um, and, and how is your organization um, committed uh, to the work of, of civics education? Yeah, well, thanks, Elizabeth, and um, I'm so admiring of everyone's work on this panel. Um, so All It Together was founded in 2014 because at the time, the United States was 54th in the world, according to the World Economic Forum, for the political participation of women. Um, last year, the World Economic Forum ranked the United States 98th. Uh, And one of the reasons for that is partially the low representation of women in elected office relative to other nations, um, but it is also the low civic participation of women. So even though they outvote men and they have voted outvoted men in every election since 1980, a fact that very few Americans actually know, even people who work in politics don't all know that, uh, but women have and they turn every election and they turn this last one as well. Um, They're not engaged in the, they have not historically been engaged in the political process beyond the ballot box. They don't hold their leaders accountable for representing the issues that they've sent them to high office to, to work on. Uh, they are less likely to write to their members of Congress to engage with them, to partition their grievances, as is their sacred right, as outlined in the First Amendment. And the core reason that we found uh, was not any of the things that most people thought about why women weren't participating. The reason was that they felt they didn't know enough to participate. Um, and, and Louise is right that there is a broad civic crisis in the United States. 70% of Americans can't name a single person who represents them in Congress. Uh, most Americans could not pass the civics test that is part of our citizenship exam. I mean, the list goes on. Uh, Americans do not know how our government works. But for women, that lack of knowledge, which is actually about the same as men, 
disproportionately keeps them out of participating. Women feel they need to know what they're talking about in order to participate. Uh, I could make some jokes about gender differences there, but I will hold back. Uh, the women actually want to feel qualified and want to feel that they know. So our mission is to focus on adult civic education. We, um, I have civics already existed when we founded. We knew there were organizations that were working on this at the school level. We wanted to get to the voting age women across America who didn't have other resources um, to learn. And our goal is uh, civic education for the purpose of participation and engagement, not just education for education's sake, but education for activism's sake. So um, just as, to answer your question about the panel, and I won't go on too long, but part of how Mark and I came to know each other and our wonderful friendship is because of a fantastic civic related program that was founded um, by uh, the presidents, former presidents and presidential libraries, um, President Bush 41, Presidents Bush 43, uh, President Clinton, in partnership also with the LBJ Library, which is called the Presidential Leadership Scholars Program, which is a very special program that they built together to try to, in, starting in 2015, to foster the future civic leaders of America. And I was lucky enough to have Mark as one of our faculty at the LBJ Library um, as part of that. And, and part of what that experience taught me um, as somebody who works on these issues all the time, um, one is that when we talk about the importance of understanding civics, I actually really believe that understanding the history of our presidents should be part of that, um, that learning from you know, the recent and, and distant past is essential to understanding the present. There's so many parallels from 1968 to now, which I will let Mark talk about because he's the expert on that. Um, but as we've talked about sort of what are the remedies for the divisions in this country, at the core, the president was able to exploit the ignorance of Americans to persuade them that their vote uh, did not, with, with, that their votes were uh, falsified, that the election was rigged. He, but he has done that. He was able to do that throughout his presidency. Um, he did it during the impeachment trial the first time. Uh, really, at every turn, you had somebody who uh, exploited uh, civic ignorance, exploited ignorance of the core principles of democracy, the separate equal separation of powers, three co-equal branches of government, uh, the right to petition your grievances, all of the, the freedom, freedom of the press. The president was able to persuade millions of people uh, that those, uh, that those uh, were uh, in, that those did not matter because they did not know better. And our view, as Mark and I talked about it, was that obviously, look, white supremacy, hate, anti-Semitism, these are deep-rooted issues in our country. Um, you know, we've been talking a lot about the recent past. I mean, look at Tim, we knew this was coming. Timothy McVeigh was a white supremacist who took down the, the building in Oklahoma. It's now more than 30 years ago. That was um, one of the first major, you know, sort of recent uh, terrorist, white supremacist terrorist attacks. We've failed for years to take seriously the threat of white supremacy in this country. And that is what was behind the six. But also, and so that I put in a separate category from just Americans who need to learn more about our institutions, right? Those are hate-filled, uh, loathsome people who should go to jail. Uh, and I, I believe they're mostly beyond redeem. I, I don't think that's worth investing a lot of time to try to convince white supremacists not to hate you or me. On the other hand, there are 75 million Americans, you know, who... Uh, were willing to support a president who fundamentally um, opposed the core roots of what is it, it means to be American, who, who opposed democracy. And that can't happen unless people have a fundamental misunderstanding of what, it act, what the flag actually means, what it actually means to be American. And the idea is that there were people carrying an American flag into the Capitol in order to try to overthrow the government. They were also carrying the flag of a, of a, of a, a president who, that's not who we are. That's just fundamentally not what America is to worship one leader. I mean, all of this is just the antithesis of what America means, what democracy means, what generations of people have fought and died to protect. So that, that's what I'll say about that. I think there are, there are endless ways in which um, civic education matters, but there have been a lot of warnings about this over the years. And we saw in this presidency, you know, and this is not about party, this is about, uh, this is about democracy. We saw in these last few years um, how possible it is to completely break down the core. We, we throw around the word democracy. People don't know what it means. 
They don't know what it means. And that is why you can have, that is what makes it possible um, for malintent, malintent to, to uh, rise. Yeah, thank you so much, Lauren. And uh, you um, really lifted up the way in which, um, you know, our recent history um, should have been more of a signal um, for, you know, the um, really awful um, developments of of the sixth. Um, And um, I know I've certainly spent a lot of time over the last few weeks um, reflecting on our our history since the Civil War um, in thinking about out um, the the ways in which we have um, insufficiently, uh, you know, addressed some of the um, underlying tensions um, that are still so deep um, and so clearly at play. And, and Mark, I want to come to you um, as um, as a historian um, and a, you know a, a leader of a presidential library. Um, eager to hear, you know, what some of your reflections were, uh, you know, about uh, about the sixth and, and, and led you to um, want to really highlight civics education as uh, one of the critical areas um, in which we need further investment and attention. Sure. And I want to thank the Commonwealth Club for, for having me and to thank you, Elizabeth and Louise and, and Lauren, for the very good work you do. You know, I, I'm reminded, Elizabeth, of a, of a, of a conversation I had with uh, Bill McRaven, who is the former commander of Special Forces several years ago. Uh, Bill um, was the one who took out, who led the mission that took out Osama bin Laden and then went on to become the chancellor of the UT, the, the, um, the, the Texas, uh, University of Texas system after his iconic make your bed commencement speech that so many of us recall. Uh, we were, this was a couple of years ago at the LBJ library, and we were waiting for former vice president Biden to come. And I was to interview him for an evening at the library. He was late due to, um, his, his flight had, had technical problems. And so, um, he was late to the interview. So we had Bill McRaven there. He's a friend. And so he and I did a conversation for this large audience of a thousand people or so before the, the former vice president arrived. And I asked him what I thought the greatest national security threat to America was. And he didn't talk about North Korea. And he didn't talk about Iran. And he didn't talk about Russia. He talked about our education system. Mm. Our greatest national security threat was uh, our, our faulty education system. And in part, if we didn't educate our citizens, our, our young students better on what our system of government is, then there would be a major threat. And we saw that threat come to bear on January 6th, earlier this month, in, in the most memorable way. And I, I will requote Louise, who said, it shook my pride. It not only shook my pride, it, it, it shook me to my core. I, I love this country. I love what it represents. But um, we are only as good as holding up our ideals and what our government means. And we need to, to educate our, our, our students on, on what America is at its, at its basic core. I, I, I mentioned to you before we did this session, as a young elementary school student, I had a social studies teacher who, it was during the Watergate hearings, would wheel a TV into our classroom and show us the impeachment hearings for Richard Nixon. And I really didn't understand what that meant at the time, but I was left with the impression that Republicans and Democrats alike were deeply concerned with the abuse of power of our president. So I was looking, I was watching the balance of power play out on my television set. That's all I needed to know as a young student, to know that there was something bigger at work here. There was something keeping the, 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 the president of the United States in check. And it was a very, very powerful idea. And it got me really interested in the presidency, which probably led to where I am today. I, I'll finish off by saying that um, one of my favorite quotes is from Harry Truman, who said, uh, the only thing new in the world is the history you don't know. Uh, and and that's, I, I think that's, that's very true. Um, doesn't necessarily repeat itself, but it rhymes. However, we have never seen 
a president of the United States try to sabotage an election and stage a coup against our government. And to go back to the point that, that Lauren made, to see um, these ostensible, the, these people who call themselves patriots, storm the citadel of democracy in the name of taking back their country, something is deeply wrong. You have to go back to, you, you, there's nothing like that in our country. You have to go to Nazi Germany or fascist Italy to see something that's similar. Uh, that, that's similar rather. So this is a wake up call. This is cold water in our face to remind us of the urgency of educating all citizens on what being America, being an American means, so that we rally around a common identity as Americans and hopefully a common purpose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much, Mark. And and I I, I wanna share something that, um, came up for me from your, your comment and then take us into the direction um, of asking each of you to talk about who else we need at this table, right? Because we're all in, we know how important this is, but we've got to get more people involved to move this forward. One piece though, you know, that has um, been shared and I think it is important that in this moment we have been able to look through history and globally to look for potential equivalents because I think that's important in helping us um, frame the um, gravity of the moment and how large our response needs to be, um, which I, I think is important in terms of the comparisons to, to fascism in Europe. The other place where I think it's important to, to look, just as we're looking back to 1918 and 1919 around global health, but is looking at the post-Civil War period. Um, I, my, um, I grew up in Boston, but have uh, roots in North Carolina. And so I've actually been learning a lot more about the Wilmington in North Carolina insurrection of 1898, where um, the only successful um, insurrection um, and really just interested in, you know, thinking about what are some of the lessons and things that we need to move forward from um, in the uh, kind of post-Civil War period, recognizing the moment we're in as um, it, not as divided, um, but not so far off that there aren't things that we can, can learn and reflect on about how we re-knit um, a country that has, um, has become very, where, where both community members and spaces have felt really far away from each other. Um, I'm, I'm interested though in, in moving in the direction of talking more about who else is at the table, right? Um, we have, have all identified, um, and, and Louise used the, the great um, point about schools are a you know, great aggregator. Um, young people are there, schools are anchors of their communities. Um, it is a logical um, and, and, and uniquely impactful space to bring um, civics to uh, communities and, and, and to young people. We believe in that at Generation Citizen. I just spent um, yesterday morning um, on a, in a virtual civics day with 50 um, young New Yorkers um, sharing incredibly powerful um, examples of the work that they're doing around lead-free schools and gun-free streets and um, their real commitment um, to uh, improving their communities in ways that they've now learned how to do um, through our programming. Um, but schools alone can't do it. Um, and, and, and even to the point of the leader of the University of Texas, a powerful school system, you know, college presidents alone can't do it. It has to be um, a collective initiative. And so I'm curious, Louise, you talked about the corporate sector, Lauren, you're, um, you know, really thinking about, um, you know, adults um, and, and civic uh, education. Um, would love to hear from each of you. Maybe I'll start with Lauren, then Louise, then Mark for a minute each. Um, who else needs to get invested in this? What other sectors um, can bring something to bear in making progress on civics education? Yeah, and I, you know, I'm going to disagree with Louise a little bit on the corporate side because we actually spend a tremendous amount of time working with corporate America. So they've pulled back from a lot of companies have pulled back from PAC contributions. But what happened in this last cycle was actually incredible, which was over a 
hundred major corporations signed on for um, time off to vote, paid time off to vote for their employees, ran huge voter registration drives um, that registered tens of millions of people. And corporate America has actually shown a willingness to do nonpartisan civic engagement in the last few years in ways that they'd never done before. It really started in the 2018 cycle. And I actually think that's very exciting and encouraging. You know, the PAC stuff for sure has been complicated. I suspect they'll go back to it. But when it comes to like the nonpartisan civic participation of employees and, and, and customers, I think there's been amazing progress there. And I hope that will continue. Um, look, I think Mark and I have been talking a lot about um, not just the civic education piece of it, but civic participation as a force for change. And we've been talking about um, national service and the opportunity to expand national service as a way to access folks who are no longer in the education system um, and, and really um, reach them uh, bring civic education into that, but also really that experience of civic participation, expanding things like AmeriCorps, Teach for America, um, Europe. Uh, there was an effort a few years ago um, with a number of folks through the Aspen Institute to look at trying to create a national service year um, that any American can participate in after, um, you know, at age 18 to 25, et cetera, to go and do a year of service. I, I really hope the Biden administration will think about something like that now. It feels like the perfect time, this sort of WPA type of feel, you know, in this economic crisis, an amazing way to potentially get Americans back to work, but then also use that as a way to help expand civics understanding. Um, so those are two that, that we've been thinking about and that I, I think are, it's a great time to do. But, you know, the other thing is like, I'd love to see some really radical stuff, like including civics as part of driver's education. Uh, you know, you want a new, you want a new driver's license. You got to take some, you got to take a little civics class online and, uh, and pass it as part of your, uh, as part of your, your driver's license. I mean, we put all kinds of gates up in this country for access to services, um, if we care about this, I think there are a lot of tools. And, and I'll just finish and hand to Mark by saying um, one of the ways that All In Together does this just very practically, and so they're not here, but I wish they were, is that we partner with direct service organizations all over the country, um, everything from homeless shelters to domestic violence shelters to um, organizations helping to get employment for the formerly incarcerated. I think the, like, the organizations that are... Uh, trusted support service institutions in every community across America, whether that's the YMCA or, uh, you know, other um, or food banks. These are all places where we have an opportunity if we can help them capacity build to reach citizens that, you know, really have a right to have a voice and should have a voice, but may not understand how to have a voice. And when we've done that, it's had really remarkable success. So I think those local trusted community organizations, grassroots organizations that are working across America, you know, all matter a lot. Yeah, I'll jump in as well uh, here, Elizabeth, if I may. I think, uh, again, Lauren and I have had lengthy conversations about the need for national service, bringing us all together we talked about, for instance, during the orientation period, what we essentially the, the boot camp uh, of that experience, teaching civics, uh, giving people a better understanding of our system of government, but also allowing them to meet people who aren't like themselves, knowing that America is very different. Lauren and I, in our piece, quoted Lady Bird Johnson, who during the very tumultuous, very tempestuous 1960s said, the clash of ideas is the sound of liberty. That the, the, our very system allows for us to think very differently about different aspects of our government. That's a good thing. That's what makes us what we are. It's a bad thing when it results in violence. Our founding fathers were deeply concerned, um, not only about an autocrat rising to power, but about the power of mobs. We saw both on January 6th. It was, it was the worst of their fears. Um, and I think that it's important for young students not only to, to know about civics, which is essentially very important ideas on parchment, but also about history because history contextualizes civics. You can see it in practice. And, and if you're a young student like I was, you get caught up in these stories mm -hmm. of these amazing people doing incredible things 
for this country and making the ideals of our country um, come to fruition in meaningful and important ways as we progress as a, as, as a nation. So I, I, I would also suggest, too, going back to um, not Lin, uh, Lady Bird Johnson, but Lyndon Johnson, um, Lyndon Johnson showed us in his presidency that you should let no good crisis go to waste. <laughs> Every one of the civil rights bills that he passed, um, despite a very resistant Congress, was done in the wake of tragedy. He got John F. Kennedy's Civil Rights Act passed due to the martyrdom of John F. Kennedy, exploiting that as a means by which to get reluctant lawmakers to say yes to something that was extraordinarily controversial. And by virtue, broke the back of Jim Crow and its false promise of separate but equal public facilities. He got the Voting Rights Act passed less than a year after um, the Civil Rights Act was passed because of the tragedy of the Edmund Pettus Bridge, what we, we now know as Bloody Sunday and the thwarted civil rights march from Selma, Montgomery, Selma, Alabama to Montgomery, Alabama in the name of voting rights, thwarted brutally by Alabama state troopers. He exploited that opportunity to show the racial injustice and we got voting rights. Uh, and then we got fair housing upon the assassination of Martin Luther King. This is a crisis moment. And I think President Biden has an opportunity to do something meaningfully legislatively to advance our society uh, by, by looking th at this as an example of where we've gone wrong. Wonderful point. And I'll just, um, uh, first of all, I agree with you completely, Mark. Um, history and civics are indivisible. Um, uh, we are just about to publish our report on the Educating for America Democracy Project on which we've been working almost 18 months about how to integrate those two disciplines, K through 12, in a very detailed way for civic agency, national guidance but about how to do that. So look for that in, on uh, our launches March 2nd. Um, but I, the answer to the question that Elizabeth asked, uh, from my point of view, is really everyone. Uh, we need a movement. We need every single American in this country to say, this must be prioritized. So we at Civics Now support a bill uh, in Congress, bipartisan, um, both in the House and the Senate, uh, which uh, provides for a substantial investment uh, to states for states to decide how to allocate um, uh, in history and civic education. Um, and that is um, a really uh, important step and we support it wholeheartedly. Um, and we certainly hope that the Biden administration will support it as well, but, but most of all um, that our legislators will see the crisis and use it for that purpose. Um, in addition to that, we have 20 state affiliate programs to change policy. So in 20 states, we are moving forward. We're prioritizing civic education. But to be frank, if parents went to their school districts and their school boards and demanded the history and civic education, um, we wouldn't need a uh, policy uh, hardly at all. So um, I, think, I think that's that's really what I see is a shift in mentality about the importance of this just to rebuild our civic strength. So, so that, that's, that would be my answer. Young people, teachers, parents, um, the corporate sector. We haven't seen as much investment in K-12, but I'm glad to see it's there um, and, um, and, and all together, right? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree, I, you know, about uh, the need for a movement and, uh, and voices from students and parents uh, who are saying this is part of the kind the education that they want. We, we've started to have some questions come in. And, um, and so I'm going to um, reflect some of those back out to you. But, um, you know, one of them is, you know, talking about in how can we recenter the purpose of school so that it's about preparing citizens rather than workers? Um, and that's uh, an important uh, question. Um, and one, I think, um, in terms of the answer, um, Louise um, does come from the voice of students and parents about saying what they are looking for. Um, but it brings us as well to another good question that's come in from, um, from YouTube and, and would encourage others to keep adding your questions in. Um, 
there is a, a, two questions that are connected. How do we communicate this universal idea within our decentralized education system? Um, and then a question about what are the stumbling blocks for civics ed? Um, and, and so recognizing the complexity, appropriate complexity um, of our education system, how is that an impediment potentially um, to civics education in the way that we're talking about it today? Um, and how do you move through that? Anyone want to well, pick up on that? I'm the expert on this and I want her to answer it, but I wonder if I could just make one quick point from the last point about this. You know, one thing about that I, I am concerned about, and I think, and I really, this was something I really learned from the LBJ library and particularly from Bill Moyers, um, the history can't be whitewashed. So history and civics are inter are, are inseparable. But part of what has also happened is that the history part of the civics education in the last from particularly the last 50 to even back to the civil war to your point has been whitewashed. And, and that whitewashing, I think, is also part of what the racial rec, you know, the the sort of the, the moment this summer about the racial reckoning, which is really a recognition that we have not dealt with honestly, the parts of our past, which continue to manifest in our present and that are so deeply rooted in racism. And the I, part of what um, really struck me from my time at the LBJ library was that how little we appreciate just how controversial passage of the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act was, how hated Martin Luther King was by so many. The fact that he had, he had a 60% unfavorable rate, you know, approval rating and all of these things that like we think about the civil rights movement now in, in a very sanitized way. And, 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 and that has the implications of that, you know, enables white supremacy to continue to rise because we just don't deal with it honestly. And so I, I just had to make that point because it's been one that was like, has been a real revelation for me over the last few years as I've been facing it. But I also think, again, back to the like just inseparability and Louise, you just said it so perfectly about the just inextrability of civics and history. That history has to be honest. And, and what's been happening is that education, and I'm not an expert on that, Louise, you'll speak to it, but in the States, you know, and this is back to civic participation, you know, state governments determine uh, a lot of the curriculum that gets taught across the country, and that has become extremely politicized. And Americans have not been paying attention to what's been going on in their state houses. Um, they have been uh, really not engaging in state uh, races, uh, not paying attention to who's getting elected to those races, and winding up with sometimes some very shocking outcomes uh, for people who are committed to, you know, certainly progressive values. Uh, and to some of these um, issues. So, you know, you've seen this in many states where uh, the part of why education has failed around civics and is failing to teach true and honest history about our racist past and about, uh, you know, the real, who we really are as a country is, is partially just the lack of attention to low, the importance of those state houses and local school boards, et cetera, the, all that local state uh, political structure that determines what our kids are learning. Louise, I'm sure you have more to say about that. <laughs> yeah, I, I completely agree. So I love the quote that Mark said about, um, from Harry Truman about uh, the history you don't know, because frankly, uh, we need to dig a little, not a little, a lot deeper to tell the histories of marginalized people and histories that are not known that are just as actual factual as the history that we do know. Um, so th there is a sense that uh, things just happened, and, but, but the actual history is much more complex, much more in depth. And that, that's what our project really is about, is to be able to unearth all those stories for all students, right? It's not, mm -hmm. this is not one segment or uh, a problem for one type of students, a problem for all types of students that we just haven't given them the skills, the knowledge, the capacities uh, that are needed in this today's democracy, which is very diverse, very complex. And, and lots of people don't know about the Tulsa massacre. They, they, they just, we need to tell stories and we need to tell them in a way that, that leaves young people hope, um, mm. but also understand um, that our, our country is built on 
um, very, very painful episodes and, and uh, our, uh, to this day, our, our history is very painful. So I will just address uh, two things. One is, uh, as my colleagues Danielle Allen and Paul Carice noticed, uh, the uh, mission of the U.S. Department of Education does not include uh, generated uh, um, graduating uh, uh, students who are uh, civically prepared and engaged, and, and that needs to change. Uh, and uh, also, if you look at the district missions, uh, as one of our other colleagues, Robert Pondicio, did, uh, that, that's a problem. Right. We need to make sure some, some of these missions talk about global citizenship. Uh, how about also uh, uh, citizenship in our country? Uh, so that would be important. Um, so that's one. Um, you know, I've been in education for a very long time. Um, and I think the, the uh, person who sent in the question is absolutely right. This is a complex system uh, that is hard to change. And what we've learned is that it cannot be a top-down measure, right? So we've had a lot of top-down, top-down, whatever top you want to talk about, federal, state, uh, local, whatever it is. Um, we need to have a very systemic approach to this. We need to have parents demand it. You need to have young people speak up as to what they want and they do. We need to have educators involved at the table from day one, but we also need institutionalized structures because it's not a short-term problem. A lot of the issues around civic education in K-12 is that people feel like this is a very uh, long-term investment and it is, right? Um, yep. But the urgency we feel now needs to, to make sure that it results in some structures that will live uh, for decades and, and even beyond that forever. And so we need those institutional homes for that kind of change. So if we were able to do that, and that is what we're working on, um, I think we would be a better country for it. And so I'll just uh, stop there. Elizabeth, may I just add one thing to what Lauren said earlier, she mentioned Bill Moyers' warning about the whitewashing of history. Bill Moyers was the, the press secretary to Lyndon Johnson during several years um, of, of, of President Johnson's White House term. But I, I, there's an old axiom that says it's easier to build a monument than it is a movement, which is to say it's easy to look back at Martin Luther King. I'm looking in, I'm in my study and I'm looking at a wonderful black and white photograph of Martin Luther King there. It's easy to look back and make a holiday for Martin Luther King. But we cannot forget about how fierce, how defiant, how iconoclastic Martin Luther King was. As Lauren said, I think he had a disapproval rating in, in the United States of almost 70%. He was considered a rabble rouser, somebody who was stirring up trouble. And in fact, what he was trying to do, as we heard in his iconic I have a dream speech is to, to get us to reach beyond ourselves to actually live up to our ideals. But we need to we need young people to see the struggle that he had and the real um, non whitewashed story of Martin Luther King so that we can equate it to what people are saying about Black Lives Matter now. Oh, they're just stirring up trouble. They're rabble rousers, right? They're just getting in the way. They want, they've, they've already gotten so much and they want so much more. That's exactly what they were saying to Martin Luther King 50 years ago. And now we have a national holiday in his honor. So uh, it's vitally important. And I, I think too, young people can relate to history if it's told in a truthful, credible, realistic way. That's what gets you involved. You can relate to these people and the struggles that they have. So I, I could not agree more with that notion of not only teaching history, but teaching it in, in a way that is realistic and that is, uh, reflects the, the struggles that we have had during the course of our years as a nation. Amanda Gorman twice in the poem uh, references Hamilton. And my 11-year-old, who literally has been listening to it on permanent loop for four straight years, I wish I was exaggerating. It's every day, all day for four years, my kid has Hamilton playing. In one second, she heard, that was what stood out to her when Amanda Gorman spoke. She's like, oh, that's Hamilton. History has his eyes on us. And then she, yesterday, was reciting George Washington's speech in his uh, departure uh, when he 
first, you know, when he, which is part of that wonderful song in Hamilton, George Washington's going home. She knows every line and she knows his entire speech and she's 11 because of it. And Amanda Gorman uses a small piece of it uh, in the poem. There are ways that we can reach people in these very deeply personal ways where it, the, the root of this extraordinary ideal of what it means to be American connects. And, you know, Hamilton for all, you know, whatever criticism you can lodge about, it's not exactly perfectly historical at all places, but it is so, it is such a perfect example of, because none of us mentioned art. And so as Mark was speaking, I I had to say that just because it's literally 24 hours a day in my house for years. Uh So I think that like that, I hope we'd see more of that kind of willingness to also bring art and culture to that, this piece of it. And I hope that's actually something I think many of us are hopeful, hopeful will come back to the White House uh, in this new administration is the the power of art and music and to, to help people connect to our ideals. And you so beautifully, Elizabeth started by talking about Amanda Gorman. And I think that is why she struck such an extraordinary chord is that the, the beauty, the beauty of the way poetry and art can elevate um, our national ideals um, is something that speaks to people across so many lines. And, you know, we, we need more of that and we need to bring more people into that. And, you know, I've worried very much about um, suffering Americans in this particular moment um, who, you know, are so, I mean, we haven't even touched on how totally disconnected now so many millions of kids are from the core of what is even their academic experience because they're at home and not in school and and all of that. We all know that's the background, but um, I I loved Mark's point about not wasting a crisis. And I I think that's exactly what this moment is, is this incredible opportunity to just refresh and renew and rebuild um, the, the best of what we are. Let me just, I'll just add, I I love this. Uh, And I I think uh, it would be great to unshackle civics uh, from civics class. Uh, It it belongs everywhere. I think our uh, Mm -hmm. students, young people are really paying attention now. And that attention can be used in so many different ways. Poetry, math, English, everywhere you could Mm -hmm. infuse uh, civics. Absolutely agree. And, um, you know, I think the uh, part of this conversation that's really stirring me is, you know, our attention to the connection between history and civics, the need to be honest in the same way that right now it means something to say you're pro-democracy. Um, we can no longer assume that that is true of, of everyone. Um, it also means something to be pro-truth, right? And um, to make sure that we are attentive to um, bringing, not, not gaslighting students, but bringing them them, um, the complexity of um, the situation, um, the country um, that that they've been born into, um, and recognizing and trusting to some degree in the resilience of young people. Um, You know, I, on January 6th, was certainly thinking about, you know, how do we talk about this to young people? What must they be thinking? And I was reminded about, um, it just came instantly, about how many of our young people um, have in fact been dealing with the fear and terror of someone coming into their classroom um, with a weapon. Um, And that this is a generation that has grown up with that um, in such a visceral and difficult way. Um, And that um, we need not shy away from telling young people the truth in developmentally appropriate ways from elementary school on up um, about this country, um, not shying away from the difficult parts because that prepares them to um, help us move to the next place forward. And and, and the civil rights movement is is such a a, beautiful um, example of this and recognizing that it was the boldness of young people um, in in streets, in boycotts, um, putting their bodies on the line um, that helped us move forward as a country um, in such a profound um, and uh, and, and consequential way um, for, for the entire country. Um, I want to try to pull in um, one more question um, from the uh, from the conversation uh, on YouTube. Um, it might not get to go to everybody, um, but I, you know, w- there's a question here about teacher preparation programs um, uh, that 
have a civic ed um, and, and there's a suggestion even of a civic ed and anti-racist requirement for, for graduation, um, uh, maybe for schools and for teacher preparation. Um, I'll say one thing briefly and then invite Louise or, or, or Lauren or Mark to say anything that they want to about the role of teachers. Um, we at Generation Citizen think a lot about that. Our model is actually to support teachers and provide them um, professional development, coaching and support um, to do experiential project based civics in the classroom. And so we think teacher preparation is everything and recognize that teachers are emerging through the same society that we're all in, which means they might not have had a really robust, engaging civics education in their own growing up, um, and that we want to co-create something powerful for, for their students together. So I think teacher preparation is essential. Um, as a part of our focus on equity in civics, um, we bring an equity-rooted um, both curriculum, um, but also values um, in terms of, of what we bring to, to teacher preparation. So, so that's really important for us. Anyone else want to pick up on, on teacher preparation um, before we go to our last question? Uh, so I'll just say uh, briefly, 100% uh, uh, agree. Uh, as a result of the disinvestment in the field in history and civics, we haven't had uh, the capacity building. And this is one area that I think will bring everybody in agreement that we need to invest in our educators uh, to be able to do this deep level work uh, that is needed. As part of the Educating for Democracy Act, um, there is a provision calling for an investment in uh, um, uh, graduates from the humanities, uh, particularly graduates of color, uh, to diversify the pipeline. And that is very important. Um, and having a background in the humanities and history, civics, political science is important because you need that depth of knowledge. And so the idea being that we should incentivize uh, that uh, kind of participation um, and that pipeline. Um, and obviously teacher preparation programs have a role to play. There's also alternative certifications that, that, that could be applied. So there's, there's a range of ways to get that. But I think everybody agrees that this is an area that's been vastly underfunded. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we're going to go to just our last question and, and I'll um, invite you to go in reverse order of how we started. So starting with Mark, then Lauren, then Louise. Um, what's one thing that people can do in their communities to make civics ed education um, a priority for everyone um, in 30 seconds, if you can? <laughs> I'm glad Mark's first. <laughs> I think Louise said it. You, you, you've got to go to your school boards and talk to them about the importance of teaching civics. We can all get involved in this but we can all implore our schools to, to take this seriously. And now is the moment. Um, I would add lead by example. Um, our children are watching and the more we participate and bring our children along to see uh, what that participation is and means the way showing up at our town board meetings and our, uh, you know, local elected uh, gatherings and uh, writing to our elected officials and showing our children the model of civic participation that's peaceful and constructive uh, and positive is absolutely transformational, taking our kids to vote with us, uh, introducing them to our local elected officials. Um, they watch and they learn and they replicate. Um, write to your Congress member and ask them to uh, urge the passage of the Educating for Democracy Act and uh, write to your school board, as Mark suggested, and ask them to draw up a civic learning plan that will guarantee how each and every student in that district will uh, graduate prepared and engaged for civic life. Fantastic. Um, what um, tremendous suggestions um, and things that everyone who is listening can do um, as, as we move forward. Um, unfortunately, this is all the time we have for today's program. Um, but And I, I want to thank um, each of our speakers today for um, what they've shared. Um, and of course, thank the Commonwealth Club, our host for today's conversation. I hope it's not the last one um, on this important topic. Um, the club's going to be posting this video along with other civic education resources at their website, www.commonwealthclub.org. Um, I'm Elizabeth Clay Roy of Generation Citizen, and um, this special virtual program of the Commonwealth Club um, has now concluded. <laughs>